Okay, so welcome today. Um, we will now continue with the um, Kalman filter or variants of the Kalman filter. So last week we looked into the simultaneous localization and mapping problem and how to solve that with a regular Kalman filter. And some of you have submitted already the exercises, um, so I will hopefully do that um, during the next week. Um, so you have at least have a rough idea on how the extended Kalman filter works and how we can actually use it for the SLAM problem. Today we'll take that a step further and test um, what, how can we actually improve the Kalman filter, or what are the limitations we have in the Kalman filter and how we can um, actually improve them. And if you look to the um, Kalman filter as well as to the um, extended Kalman filter, then to the um, uh, extended common filter as well as to the common filter, um, then we can see that one of the key limitations are these linear functions or the linearization of the <coughs> functions. So the common filter itself um, required that we have a linear function for the motion as well as for the uh, measurement model and the EKF obtained the linear function by linearizing our nonlinear function took the mean estimate, was linearizing around the mean estimate, and then using this linear approximation of the original function. And one of the questions is, can we actually do better? Especially if you're in the robotic the context, for example, of robotic motion models, and you have a robot that moves through the environment, has errors in its orientation, as well as in its um, translational movements, and we get these kind of banana-shaped distributions. And this is one thing where these nonlinear functions can be problematic, and the question is, can we actually do better? And is there actually a better way than just linearizing our function? And it turns out, yes, there is a better way to do that. And one of those better ways to do that is the so-called unsetted transform. There's one technique we will look into today on how to obtain better estimates of our um, mean and covariance estimate when they are propagated through a nonlinear function. It's kind of the key idea. We don't want to approximate the function g or h itself. We just want to, to look how is um, a mean and a covariance estimate propagated through that nonlinear function. And this leads then to the so called unsetted Kalman filter, which is basically a Kalman filter using the ideas of this unsetted transform to obtain better um, mean and covariance estimates. So if you look to the DKF, so it was using the Taylor approximation. What was done, so we have our, for example, initial estimate of the um, mean and uncertainty, for example, robots post. We're linearizing our function around the mean, this point here, propagating this function, and then we may end up with this um, Gaussian over here. So this is what's the standard approach. So the question is, how can we do that better? Does anyone have an idea how we could actually better propagate the uncertainty we have here through a nonlinear function and still obtain a Gaussian estimate? So you may consider the figures that I've shown um, for the motion model. So we have this kind of small dots, and for every different motion, we draw one of those dots, and then we have kind of this probability distribution. Could you use a similar trick here? Sampling. How would we do that? Could we do that? Just rough ideas. I mean, I don't expect any precise description of what's going on here. To come up, but just to get some ideas on how would you try to do that? We sample and uh, we add motion and uh, noise to the uh, current position and the, to the motion model, I mean, but, and calculate where we will end. And uh, based on these noises, uh, <coughs> we get some different. Uh, <coughs> Uh, different values for the for next position and some of some kind of R and uncertainty. Yes, yeah, so that's pretty similar to the idea we are actually going to use. So what we could do is we could take this covariance matrix over here and populate it with points, with samples. And then we could propagate all those points through this nonlinear function. 
and then we'd expect to get a couple of points somewhere in this area over here. Then we could use these points to recompute the Gaussian relief. So if we consider um, this motion with these, um, say we had our initial uncertainty here, mean and covariance estimate, and then say we populate this space with samples randomly, draw them from the Gaussian. Then you could take a nonlinear function and propagate all these points through a nonlinear function. So it may look up look something like this. Whatever, here, 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 here. So in the end, we may come up with a couple of points which are distributed similar to that. They could simply take those points and say, Let's take these points and compute the Gaussian from these points. So we would end up with something like this. That's actually one way, one way for doing that. So given we have a nonlinear function, we generate a huge number of those sample points, propagate these sample points, and then recover the mean and the covariance. What is the problem with this technique? If I do that in practice. Yeah, so it's computationally time consuming to do all these operations. Because we, especially even if my uncertainty is huge, I may need a huge number of samples to do that. Okay, this is exactly the point where the uncentered transform tries to do it in a better way. So what the uncentered transform does, it in a specific way computes so-called sigma points. This is very similar to those samples we had here. The only difference is here that these sigma points are um, deterministically determined. So it's not that we kind of sample those points, but we choose these points according to a, let's see, according to a pattern. And based on this pattern, we propagate our points through our nonlinear function. So this point will be mapped over here, this point will be mapped over here. We may end up with a distribution of points like this. And then we recompute the Gaussian from these points and um, in order to achieve that, we also need to have a way for those points because these points are chosen in a special way. So depending on how we choose the, the where we choose the points, we need different weights to make sure we really approximate the Gaussian distribution. So if you would start, if you would not transform the Gaussian distribution, we will take those points, leave them as they are, and then reconstruct the, the Gaussian distribution. We should get the same mean and the same covariance, right? And so we cannot simply take those points and compute a mean and a variance from those points. We need to weigh them with a, certain, with a special weight so that this distribution actually resembles from that. So we need, can choose those sigma points and weights. And with this combination of sigma points and weights, the goal is here to um, recover the Gaussian estimate through our nonlinear. Okay, so um, <coughs> we have our, so the, the, the key idea of the, or the kind of key steps of this uncentered transform is to compute these so-called sigma points from my current Gaussian distribution. Then to um, com compute a special weight for each sigma point, which is selected according to the way those points are chosen, with the idea if I would reconstruct the Gaussian from these weighted points, I would get exactly the same Gauss and mean and covariance I had before. But then I um, propagate these sigma points through my nonlinear function, and then I recompute those, uh, the, the Gaussian after I have propagated those points. And um, so the, the key thing for that is this avoids the linearization, or the Taylor um, approximation that the EKF does, and typically leads to a better estimate of the Gaussian distribution. So the key questions we have in here is, how should we actually choose our sigma points, and how should we choose the weights? I just told that, or sketched that a little bit already. What are the constraints we have? The constraints we have is, if we go back to our example we had here. So we have here our ellipse with all these the sample points. <coughs> if we would use as our um, nonlinear function, a linear function, basically the, uh, the special case, if G equals the identity matrix, 
Then we have those points over here, and if you recompute the mean and the variance from the sigma points, you should want to get, end up with the same distribution. So if you take, let's say we call our sigma points um, x, um, then we want to achieve that the mean of our distribution should be equal to the sum over a weight term, weight i, times our sigma points i. So just by doing this sigma point, uh, sigma point representation, not transforming it at all, and recomputing our belief, we want to end up with exactly the same mean. Otherwise, it would be pointless. Otherwise, if the robot, for example, does move, we would apply our function very often. Simply, our belief would degenerate. Okay. And we want to have exactly the same for the covariance. So the same holds for the covariance. So we have all of those sum weights, let's say mean weights, covariance weights, they don't need to necessarily be the same. And then I have um, uh, the sigma point minus the mean computed, and x minus the mean transpose. And something else I need to achieve is if I have those points, the sum over these points need to be one. So the sum, uh, sum of the weights, sorry. Sum over the weights need to be one. So we have our so we have instead of sigma points, instead of weights, as I said before, we want to have that the sum of the weights equals to one, and that the mean, original mean, without any applying any transformation, should be should be recovered um, from these those weighted sigma points, and the same holds for the um, covariance estimate. So it's kind of our goal. The problem is well, not really a problem, but the thing is that there is no unique solution on how to choose those sigma points and how to choose those weights. But there's a whole space of solutions on how we can do that. And so it turned out that one typically chooses one way, although um, in most of the setting there's it's actually no difference in which way you choose. It, it can depend on the structure of the, of the nonlinear function you're going to apply, um, how the solution scales, or if there are problems with the solution. But um, one way, the typical way to choose those sigma points, which um, leads to the name I said, the transform, is that the first sigma point is chosen as a mean. And then we add additional sigma points. And these sigma points are computed to this first side weird formula. What it does is, these, the first thing you need to know is that these points are centered around the mean, which also makes sense because it's kind of, the mean is kind of the most important area of my Gaussian distribution. And then I add a value and I subtract exactly the same value from this uh, for vector from this Gaussian. So what we and we do this for every dimension. So we have n dimensions. We have a mean and we have <coughs> one point plus a mean and one point minus a mean in some direction. And the direction is in this case the same. So we have always have pairs of points centered around the mean. Okay. So let's have a look what this formula actually does. So we have the n here is the dimensionality of our um, Gaussian distribution. And <coughs> the second term here is a parameter, a scaling parameter. This mainly determines how far are these points away from the mean. You can actually see that they are here under the square root, but it's dimensionality. It depends on the dimensionality and on this term lambda, how far the points are away. So the smaller lambda is, the closer those points go to the mean and the bigger lambda, the further they are away. And then we have the covariance matrix C here, but under a square root. This is, kind of, this is called matrix square root. And this matrix square root, um, so you can get some idea um, on, before I draw, I first explain the mesh and then I have some figures uh, that made it clear. So what is the matrix square root? The matrix square root is defined as S, so that S times S replicates the original matrix. So like, you would intentionally write the square root. And one way to compute this is by diagonalization. So, since sigma is a semi-definite um, symmetric matrix, we can actually diagonalize this. And so we get a diagonalized form with the matrix V. 
sum matrix D and the matrix V to the power of minus one, so that the matrix D is in diagonal form. And these, you can actually, if you, who knows what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, who has heard that? One person, okay. Um, so you can transform a matrix in this diagonal form, if it's called diagonalization, so that this matrix D consists of a matrix where there are only elements in the main diagonal. And these, they have real values of this main diagonal, and these are the so-called um, eigenvalues. You can also compute corresponding eigenvectors. And if you look to a Gaussian that you do that in 2D, this would be my Gaussian distribution. They have certain properties. The eigenvectors point along the main axis of the uh, of the uh, covariance, and the size of this matrix here um, is given by the the, so the lengths, how this the looks is scaled. It depends on the eigenvalues. So this is what we call the eigenvector. So this would be the first eigenvector, the second eigenvector, and the length is proportional to the first eigenvalue and the second eigenvalue. So if this line value gets bigger, the ellipse is scaled in this direction. And if this gets bigger, it's scaled in this direction. So if we have a covariance, which is a circle, what does it mean for the eigenvalues? Exactly. So if all, if lambda 1 equals lambda n, then it means we have a circular covariance uh, matrix. But the more different they are, that means we have more uncertainty in one of the dimensions. That's actually the way um, it's also used, for example, in the MATLAB scripts we use for plotting this ellipse. Actually, looks to the eigenvalues uh, and that for actually plotting this ellipse. Once I have this matrix, this form V, D, V to the power of minus 1, I can actually write this matrix D as d squared times d squared. So this, this term is d squared, and I can express this as a matrix that's called d to the power of a half. So d half is exactly this d11 one one square root of that. So d and n square root, and everything else is 0. And so we can actually write this as our matrix sigma is v d half d half d minus 1. Right? Because if we multiply these two matrices, we multiply the elements in the main diagonal, we come the rest to 0 for all the elements. Okay. What happens now? So, anyone has an idea of how I can, from, from this idea of how I can end up computing s? So that the constraint lima equals s times s satisfied. The d to uh, the denominator to power of four, I think. Yeah. So this, sorry, this matrix. This matrix to power of four, I think, because oh. um, we if we s sigma sigma is equal to s multiplied by s. Um, well, if we put a tick to the power of 4, yeah, we are pretty far away. So um, we can actually define S as V D half D to the power of minus 1. So just replace this the matrix in the middle with um, the square root of the individual elements on the main diagonal. Because if I do that, what happens if I compute s times s? I have 3 d half b minus 1 times v d half b minus 1. So this gives me v d half b minus 1, v d half b minus 1. You can see that these two terms cancel out because it's the inverse times the matrix itself gives the identity. This is the identity matrix. And then I end up as 3d half d half 
uh, v minus 1. This is v, d, v minus 1. Okay. So if I can compute this diagonal form of this matrix, I can actually compute the square root. Also, the here in the slides, so I don't need to copy that down. Select S in this way, <coughs> and we can write S S equals these terms exactly what I did on the blackboard. Okay. That's one way how the matrix square root is defined. Some other people define the matrix square root as um, matrix L, where sigma is L L transpose. If I do that, one technique directly pops up, which is the Cholesky decomposition, because the Cholesky decomposition exactly computes a decomposition on a, of a lower triangular and upper triangular matrix, so that um, they are equal, the transpose, so the upper and lower two. Other one transpose so that their product gives in sigma. So um, the advantages of the Cholesky factorization that is typically numerically stable, huge matrices, <coughs> of sparse copies, sparse matrix where elements are zero, is a numerically st stable solution to do that. And therefore, in the context of UKF implementations, people often use the Cholesky factorization to um, compute this matrix square root. In the end, the shapes of these distributions the kind of the direction of the eigen um, values are actually so the directions of the eigenvector, sorry, are the same for uh, exactly. so L and sigma have the same eigenvectors, so they paint, point the same direction of the um, of the covariance matrix over here. So these vectors go point to the same direction. And therefore in the end, if I use one or the other, it doesn't really matter. So you choose the sigma points based on the matrix square we have here, and these are the individual column vectors, so the i's column vector and the, um, the i, i's minus 1's uh, column vector. So this ends up in getting sigma points, which are kind of, I've always pairs of sigma points distributed around the mean, so this is the mean, I have one sigma point, the corresponding one here, another one here, here. The important thing is, Typically, or quite often, depending on the shape of the of the distribution, the points lies on the main axis of the of the covariance matrix, but it doesn't have to be the case. So, if I have just a small MATLAB example, this is also one of the um, exercises you will have to do this week. So, my initial uncertainty is the red curve over here, and I can compute the sigma point. I can compute the square root, which is this matrix over here, the blue one, and then you can um, you obtain the sigma points over here. These are these five points because we have the two-dimensional Gaussian uh, distribution. We have the mean and then two pairs of sigma points that we end up with obtaining these sigma points. What we then would do, we would take those sigma points, propagate them through our nonlinear function, and then recompute the Gaussian distribution. Zero. Things unclear at the moment here. So I know that this may not be directly graspable, or you may not have the feeling of having completely understood everything, but if anything unclear which I can help you understand right now. The lambda parameter is, is, is a, if you go back to the equation, it simply says the bigger lambda gets, the bigger, so this is a product which is multiplied with the. Yes, so we will, we will set this parameter. The reason is why we can set this parameter is that, the, as I said before, the unsetted transform doesn't have a unique solution on how we set the sigma points. There are multiple solutions. And this kind of free parameter, which is one way for um, generating sigma points that all fulfill the constraints we want to have at the beginning. So we have to set them at some point later on. I will provide some values later on how you can set them, for example. Okay. So the next thing we need to talk about are the weights. And I'm actually not going to deeply explain how these weights are set. The important thing is we have two different kinds of weights here. We have a weight for weights for the covariance matrix and we have weights for the mean. And the for estimating the mean. And the um, the first weight, so the weight with the index zero, this is the weight which corresponds to the original mean point, so the first sigma point. 
This has a special weight, so this is for the, the weight for the mean. And this is weight for the covariance. We again have two free scaling parameters which we can set in here. I'll find beta. It's so again because we don't have a unique solution. And the all the weights for the sigma points with an index one or larger, they have the same weight which is given here. If I sum up these weights and these weights, we actually end up uh, with fulfilling the constraints we want to have. So with various weights and these are three parameters we have in the system. Okay. If we want to, if we have computed those points and we propagated those points, we can actually recompute the mean um, based on the transformed point. So we have here um, mu prime, this is the transformed uh, mean and the transformed covariance, which now does the sum of the sigma the signal points times the transformed point. So we just take our sigma points, transform our sigma points, and then recover the Gaussian distribution. We do exactly the same for the covariance. Are they clear? They lost that. So how does this look in practice? So let's say we have our nonlinear function, which looks like this, which was also the example we had in the um, in the case of the extended Kalman filter. So what we can do is we have our mean here of our origin Gaussian distribution. This is transformed over here. And then we could choose two sigma points because the one-dimensional Gaussian, so we have three sigma points in sum, the mean, and something plus and minus the mean, which depends on the variance of the Gaussian. So the bigger the variance is, the more these points move away from the mean, the smaller it is, the closer the points are at the mean. Then I propagate those points, so one point ends up being here, the other point ends up being here. And then I recompute the Gaussian distribution from that. So um, the dotted line is the result the unsettled transform provides, and the uh, non-dashed line is the true one. And this one you see here in the background is really the distribution you get. So we, we obtain this distribution by propagating it from the linear function. And if we compute the mean and the variance from this distribution over here, the gray distribution, we end up getting the black line and the unsettled transform computes us the dotted line just by transforming only three points and not all the let's say densely subsetted points which would give us the distribution. So we are what you can see, given that we have a difference here, it's not the optimal solution. But as we can at least illustrate later on, this is better than the Taylor approximation. So we still don't obtain the optimal one. The optimal one we would obtain with the technique you presented before with this sampling the points. If you put number of points the person, then we would be able to come up with a correct true mean and true, true variance over here. That would require a sample infinite number of points. Then it would work for any distribution. How many of these points are enough to calculate? The answer to transform uses 2n, where n is the dimensionality, plus 1. So you have 1 for the mean, then you take pairs which are distributed around the mean, one pair for every dimension. So if you have a 100 dimensional uh, Gaussian, you would take 201 points. Let's go for another example. So what you see here is the red one is kind of an input covariance matrix and mean we have. We then can compute the sigma points, which are here shown by those red um, crosses. If we then transform them, in this case, to a linear function by just adding 1 to x and y, we obtain those points and can, can recompute the covariance matrix. You can see here the shape is exactly the same because it's just shift. So it doesn't change the computation of the covariance. The shape stays exactly the same, only the mean has moved. Since so every point is moved exactly in the same way, or exactly the same distribution, just shifted somewhere else. So in case of a linear function, we get exactly the same result as the as in the Kalman filter, where we can compute the new Gaussian in closed form, or with the EKF, where it's a linearization, and since it's a linear function, 
the linearization gives me, gives me exactly my function or the answer they transform. In the linear case, they give me exactly the same result. If I, I'm operating in a, with a nonlinear function, so just randomly selected a function here, so for the x component, it's 1 plus x plus sine sin of top 2x and cosinus of y, and cosine simply 2 plus 0 0.2 times y. So clearly a nonlinear function. And if I propagate them again, compute the points that we had them before, I propagate them, and so I end up with this, these five sigma points lying over here. Then I can recompute the Gaussian distribution from the weighted points, and then this is my nonlinear recovery of those points. Okay. So, putting the uncertain transform on a single slide, what do we have to do? We have to compute first sigma points according to this fixed formula. Then I need to compute a weight for all those sigma points. And then I simply transform the sigma points through my nonlinear function and recompute the mean and the covariance. That's it. As I said, there are a few free parameters you can set. So um, and this, the reason for that is these, these parameters that we, um, they have a unique solution how to select the weights and the sigma points so that they satisfy the constraints we said before. Namely, that if there's no transformation, that they reproduce the original um, Gaussian that we have. Um, the parameters are shown here is not the ones of the original uncentered transform, but of the so-called scaled uncentered transform, which is an extension of the um, uncentered transform, which has some nicer properties, especially in terms of high dimensional spaces, because you may have some numerical issues that um, the matrix, matrices you obtain are not definite anymore, and therefore we have the scaled unsettled transform which doesn't suffer from those issues. Therefore, I put that the scaled unsettled transform, but you know, from the first view, it's not that much different. So we have basically, we have our original parameter lambda, which now consists of a parameter <coughs> alpha squared n plus kappa minus n, where n is a dimensionality, so we obtain here two parameters kappa and, um, and, and alpha. Kappa has to be greater or equal to zero, and lambda needs to be between bigger than zero and smaller or equal to one. And um, we have a second parameter beta, which <coughs> was appeared in one of the computations for the weight for the covariance matrix. Um, if you set it to two, it's the optimal choice for the Gaussian distribution it can be used to cover higher order moments of the, of the distribution. So if you, higher order moments, so the moments are the first moment and the second moment are the mean and the covariance. They are higher order uh, moments for distributions. For example, um, the, the screws, one of those, the parameters, um, just to illustrate that here, the Gaussian, um, and you kind of, let's say you push the Gaussian from that side so that it kind of looks like this. This would be, um, this would have a third moment which has a screw in, in this direction. So it's called the screw. There are higher order mo uh, moments which describe um, parameters of moments, so called moments of distribution, but they are zero in case of the Gaussian, which is a perfectly symmetric distribution. And uh, depending on what your underlying distribution is, you can, if you, so if you have background knowledge about your, your distribution, you can optimize those parameters, especially the parameter B. But for Gaussian, it's two, and if you don't have any further information, one for heuristic is to need is two. Okay, so some examples. Well, just to see how the parameters change the, uh, the, the shape of the sigma points. If you, so in this, all these cases, the parameter kappa was set to three, and I just only varied the alpha parameter. So if I set alpha to 10 to the power of minus two, you actually see that the sigma points are very, very, very close to the and as I increase the value of alpha 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, they move further away from the mean. This is exactly the behavior I described before. Right. But the maximum value we can get for alpha is 1, and then they are kind of lying somewhere around here. So this is one of the parameters. The parameter kappa has a similar uh, behavior, but it's not limited to. Um, to, um, it's only limited to values bigger or equal to zero, so I can actually 
put this kappa parameter very high. And also the higher I set the kappa value, the further these sigma points move away. It's just depends, so there are two different parameters because depending on the parameter alpha, you can give more weight to the, to the original mean in the distribution because it appears in the, the weight terms. And therefore, this term may be, uh, may be different over here, but if you increase kappa and if you increase alpha, they both have the effect of moving the sigma points further away from the mean. Okay, so we roughly, so far we talked about the answer to transform. So a way to recover the Gaussian distribution, given that we have a Gaussian, um, and we propagate this Gaussian through a nonlinear function. So the next step is to incorporate this into the um, common extended common filter that we had before, uh, into the common filter itself. So we had the extended common filter, which looked like this, we discussed this in the previous weeks, and let's say, Let's use this algorithm and step by step replace the functions we have in here so that we end up with non centered common filter. So we want to get rid of the matrix G, which was Jacobian for the motion, and the matrix H for the update, uh, for the Jacobian of the measurement. So we, in the end, we need to replace all functions here which where G and an H um, is present. Let's go towards the uncentered transform, uncentered common filter, and start with the, um, with the prediction step. So we need to replace um, these equations, the equations we had before, by the sigma points which we propagate through um, the nonlinear motion function or motion model to come up with the UKF prediction step. And then we'll continue with the rest. Okay, how do we do that? Using the answer to transform, but I'd like to hear from you how he, how you would do that now. Think two minutes about it while I'm wiping the whiteboard, work, and then. Zero to two n, or from one to n 
20 plus 1 um, of the mean times and then the star sigma point i. And the, exactly the same we can do for the covariance. Some I covariance uh, star I minus mean same over here. Perfect. That's the motion update of the unsession cover. See if they go here, here. See if they haven't done any mistake. Uh, oh, small mistake. So this was just the uncertainty. So uh, moving the, uh, propagating the uncertainty we had before through the nonlinear function, but we have to add the additional noise term for the motion. This kind of the error which comes from the motion. This is added. This term over here, which we forgot from the blackboard. So that's it. Perfect. First part is done. The second thing we need to do after this has been computed is to compute the common gain. Else to compute the expected observation, again using the sigma point approximation, and then computing the common gain. Once we have the common gain, we can update the mean and the covariance. Okay. So this gets a little bit more complicated, but not too complicated. Um, so again, we have to generate a new set of sigma points given our new estimate, because the motion model, or the motion update prediction step, generated the predicted mean and the predicted covariance. And from, from this uh, distribution, we again have to generate our sigma points for the next step. This was what's done in the first round here. So these gamma is just square root of n plus one. And we do that, of course, for, kind of do that for all sigma points. And the next thing we do is we need to compute our expected observation, right? So function h, computing the expected observation given the state estimate. And so we take the sigma points, which are our state estimate, and in this way obtain um, sigma points, which is here this um, calligraphic z, the sigma points, and which I then use to compute my predicted observation. And the predicted observation I compute in a straightforward manner, except the, exactly as we did before. So we have the weight for the mean, uh, which is again, of course, here um, recomputed, and the, um, the, the transformed sigma points. And I can do exactly the same for the covariance of these, for example, feature observations. Do exactly the same, now I add the observation dots then. So until here, everything should be kind of here. Right? Or is there any uncertainty up to line 9? Everything which is unclear. Okay, so in the end we have done exactly the same as the motion step. Then we have a second term over here, which is the cross correlation between the state and the um, and the, and the observation. And this can be computed directly from the sigma points about the state and the transformed sigma points we use in our observation. And this term is used to compute the Kalman gain. The first component of the Kalman gain times the inverse of this matrix. And why this is the case should become clear if you look to the um, EKF formula. So what the EKF did, it took the um, Good estimate of the of the covariance matrix plus the transform of the Jacobian of H plus the um, this term over here. Now this term over here is exactly our term ST, so the uncertainty of the predicted observation, because what the Kalman gain in the end is is kind of a weighted sum on how much do we trust the observation and how much do we trust the prediction. Right? So this term was the uncertainty of the, um, of the observation. And this is exactly this term we have over here. So the expected uncertainty of the observation we have. Just the inverse of that. We need to inverse ST. This part over here. And the second part here was the sigma times 
the um, Jacobian, and this tells me, gives me the cross correlation. So how does um, so this is kind of the uncertainty we have about the um, observation? So what does the observation provide me, and how does this translate? to a weighing factor weighing the uncertainty of the um, observation and the uncertainty of the uh, predicted status you may have. So there's these two terms um, is exactly the same as the cross invariance between the state and the observation. Therefore, I compute, can compute it here exactly with the sigma points, ending up with the common weight equation like that. So if you can really one-to-one -one replacement of the formulas from the EKF, and then you end up exactly at that common. Okay, so common gain we have. Um, if we go back, then there are two, up, two, two further steps in computing the mean and the covariance. And this we can simply add. So this equation stays exactly the same as in the, um, in the extended, uh, extended common filter. This equation here changes it a little bit. The reason for this is we have an H term in there as well. We don't have the H term anymore. So, um, but we can actually show that this term is equivalent to the short derivation I will um, go into now. Um, that is exactly the same than the updates that we have for the column filter. You can do that by starting with the um, update of the covariance matrix that we had in the column filter, which is the first slide. So this is the last line of the column filter. The first thing I do in this step, I take HT and sigma T, which is exactly the transpose of this um, cross covariance, so uh, the sigma x um, z, so in the time x t is the sigma x. So this is just a replacement, so this term here is exactly this term, the transpose, per definition. So it's exactly the one if you go back, um, what we had here. So this was the term, this, and now we have on the new slide h times sigma, so this is exactly the same on transpose, because sigma equals sigma transpose. That's what I have. Just replace this term by the device transpose. But the next thing I do, I um, add here, I multiply this by the identity matrix, which I can split up into s to the power of minus 1 times s. Of course, these two terms is the identity matrix, right? So just can add, multiply it in there, hurting no one. If have this formula where you can say, hey, you know, this term over here was exactly the definition of the common game. Common gain I already computed, so I can exploit that. So I compute the common gain over here, resulting this in the common gain times st. Everything transpose. Then I can uh, transpose. So if I have these two matrix matrices and transpose them, it means I swap the order and transpose them individually. So I end up in st times um, common gain transpose. Since st is a covariance matrix, it's transpose is equal to the matrix itself. I can skip this transpose and end up with this equation, which is the EKF equation. So there's kind of no black magic by it. This, was this term over there was replaced by this term. It's just that here, I don't have H anymore in the, uh, in the uncited common filter. So I need to make some replacements with elements I have so that I have an exact, that's kind of an exact manipulation of these terms. Um, and I'm able to compute the new signal. So that's it. UKF is done. Let's see how it um, behaves in contrast to the um, EKF. So what's the difference between the EKF and the UKF? So we have, this is our input function over here, as an example, with the mean propagate over here. So here you can see the estimate for the UKF, here you can see the estimate for the EKF. And the main thing you see is that the mean is somewhat different, so this is a true mean. The EKF is further away from the true mean because the difference here is smaller than the difference here. And if you look to the estimate of the uncertainty, it's even much, it's even significantly worse. This reason is because the common of the UKF uses the sigma points over here, which are further away from the mean to kind of better cover the shape of the um, covariance matrix, and therefore the this estimate, which is the estimate of the UKF, the dash line is much better than the estimate of the dash line over here, which is the result from the EKF. So the EKF is, did a worth job in terms of propagating the Gaussian distribution through the nonlinear function. Because the um, Taylor expansion is less good compared to the, um, 
to the EKM. If you do the same for the smaller covariance over here, then you can actually see that the difference is smaller. So the error is smaller for the EKF. This is something we discussed before. If the uncertainty is very small, the linearization is not too bad, because typically it's at least locally not a too bad approximation. And, but we can still see, roughly, if you go close enough to the slides, you can see that the um, uncertainty estimate here um, of the EKF is still a little bit worse than the one of the EKF. So you can also compare this kind of banana shape distribution. So if this is the banana shape distribution where the points are uh, distributed according to, for example, the motion model, the EKF typically approximate this by this Gaussian distribution. You can especially see that these areas outside this distribution are very badly covered. If you do the UKF, the UKF approximate this banana shape the distribution that looks like this. So here this area, which is outside the uh, kilos, is smaller compared to this, but still not the optimal one. Okay. okay. So there's even an example which I took from a book. It was kind of a nice example over here, which also estimates the the update of the um, uncertain transform used in an EKF or a UKF. So this is the original points or points which describe the distribution. So we have our covariance and our mean, which is used in our filter. If I now propagate this function through this nonlinear function, the points are now distributed like this, kind of shaped in space. If I compute the true mean and true covariance from these points, I end up with this estimate over here. So if I look to the common filter, what would the common filter do? We say, hey, perfect, I have my mean estimate and my um, my Covariance, I propagate it, and I end up with this pink um, distribution over here. The black one is the true one, and the pink one is the one the UKF provides. If I do that with the UKF, I sample my sigma points, transform the sigma point through this nonlinear function, um, could use the weights to recover the mean and the covariance, I end up with the green loss over here. You can actually see that. Still, the green is not there where the black one is, but the green is significantly better than the pink one. Significantly better covers the distribution. So the answer to transform is one way to avoid the linearization in um, the common filter for propagating the mean and the uncertainty of the Gaussian distribution, and simply does it in a smaller way. Smaller variance here, the approximation error is smaller. So the answer to transform is just an alternative to the linearization, and it typically leads a better result than the Taylor approximation. What it does, it uses the sigma points. We have a couple of free parameters we can set the sigma points. And um, what the answer to transform then does, it propagates the sigma points. And um, the, um, what the UKF in the end does, it just replaces this linearization by the sigma point propagation. It's kind of the key idea of the unsented transform used in the unsented color field. If you compare the UKF and the EKF, in terms of their properties, it has been shown that it provides the same, the uncertain common filter provides the same result as the EKF for linear models, and then the same as the common filter does. So for linear models, they all perform in the same way. They estimate the same mean, the same covariance. Maybe up to some small numerical differences. Maybe. <coughs> um, but the UKF is better than the EKF in the case of nonlinear effects. So if nonlinear functions, the EKF, the UKF either provides the same estimate as the EKF or performs better. Um, often, however, it's noted that these differences are somewhat small. It actually depends on the nature of your observations and the nature of your, for example, motion model in your application. If it's highly nonlinear in some weird shape, the, EK, the gain of the EKF may be larger or smaller, but typically it's not too huge. But another advantage if you want to implement the UKF is that you don't need to compute the Jacobians, the so called the derivative free filter of the UKF. Because I just use my sigma points to compute it, I don't need to derive my function. So the H and the G matrix do not need to be computed anymore. Depending on what kind of function you're using, this may be more complicated or, or easier. But uh, it's actually nice that just by this uncentered transform, you can get completely rid of the uh, need of computing your Jacobian. Um, 
Both filters are exactly in the same complexity class, so not one is more complex than the other, although the unsetted common filter typically is a little bit slower for computing those sigma points. So it's as a constant factor slower, and there's no change in the general complexity class, class of both algorithms. Um, but the key limitations of both of them is still they only work on Gaussian distributions, or they always kind of approximate by a Gaussian distribution properly at this Gaussian distribution. So we are still in the Gaussian framework, we only have the possibility to deal with these nonlinear functions. It's still one of the limitations of the UKF, which it doesn't eliminate from the EKF. So again, most of the material I presented here is from the chapter 3.4 of the Progressive Robotics book, and there are um, some other ways you want to look at that, because the book is actually, it doesn't go too much into the details here. Um, there's the original work of um, Sam Julia and Ullman, who invented the unsetted transform and the unsetted Kalman filter, actually four robotics applications in 1995. And there's a new version of 2000 where they, they talk about the scaled unsetted transform having some of the advantages. But the original mass is here in the paper. It's also on the website. And there's also a script in setting it's in German from uh, a professor here at German University, which talks about the unsetted transform and the bearings of the unsetted transform, which may be worth reading. Okay, so are there any questions about the answer to come up with or anything that is unclear to you at the moment? The dimensions are the same common game covariance. Yes, they are all the same. So we really just replaced the um, kind of closed form solution under the linear um, approximation of how to multiply those matrices to come up with. Uh, the matrix you want to have by this sampling process and to, avo to avoid the linearization, but the dimensionality of the Kalman game and everything stays the same. Yes, you know. Any further questions? Okay, perfect. <laughs>